Nathan Sun virtually tonight. Uh, uh, before I begin, let me just give you the notice that with the concept, consent of uh, Professor Howes and um, uh, Nathan Sun's request, we're recording this event. So uh, I just wanted to put you on notice that uh, this event will be recorded and might be uploaded on uh, Nathan Sun's YouTube channel. So um, the second announcement, let me make a statement, uh, which is uh, on land acknowledgement. Before we get started, so this event is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same place. I recognize this land acknowledgement might not be uh, you know, the territory that you're currently on. I ask if this is uh, the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. But Osgood Law School, Osgood Hall Law School acknowledges its presence and the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto uh, uh, has been uh, caretaken by the Anishina Anishinaabek Nation, uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Métis. It's now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders and the Mississaugas of the new credit First Nation. Uh, this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, we're gonna have a very exciting and uh, timely talk with Professor Rob House, who is with me here. Uh, uh, before I, I introduce uh, Rob, um, I just have a very small, short uh, int introduction for myself. So, so I'm a visiting scholar at Nathanson. On the announcement, they said uh, I'm a former Iran's chief trade negotiator, which is correct. But I just wanted to make a disclaimer here that I'm not a typical like your Islamic Republic di diplomat. My motivation at the time, I worked for, uh, as an advisor there uh, for two years. And I've always been an out outsider and not part of the government apparatus. Uh, I just worked there to help my country join and integrate the world economy back in 2015 and 16 at the time of the nuclear negotiations. So I left my university job in New Zealand and went back to Iran to do that. So everything that I say today is nothing has nothing to do with the position of the government of Iran. Uh, I always have the national interests of the country and the nation in my heart and in my mind. So without further ado, thank you very much, Professor Rob House. Professor Rob House is, um, uh, one of the most well-known professors of international law and law generally in the world. Honestly, uh, I think he's the authority on international trade law, international economic law. Uh, he is the uh, Lloyd C. Nelson Professor of International Law at New, New York law, School of Law. He has received his BA in Philosophy and Political Science with highest distinction at uh, LLB with honors from the University of Toronto when he was the uh, co-editor-in-chief of the Faculty of Law Review. He holds an LLM from Harvard Law School, like myself. Uh, he's been a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and visiting professor at Harvard Law School, Tel Aviv University, Hebrew, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and University of Paris, Pantheon Sorbonne, um, Osgoode Hall Law School in Canada, taught at the Academy of European Law, European University Institute in Florence. Um, he has a, 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 no short introduction would do justice to Rob. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that he has, so obviously Rob is from Canada, from Toronto. He has a Canadian diplomatic background, which goes back to late Pierre Trudeau. Uh, he, was, uh, amb uh, he was ambassador, uh, Canadian ambassador in the disarmament committee on UN uh, back in the 80s during the Cold War. We were just talking about it before we started this talk. And he's currently affiliated also is a membership, uh, a, a member of the leadership circle in the foreign policy for uh, America. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for uh, coming in. So um, um, I, uh, we decided with Rob to discuss this, uh, to have this on a, on a very informal basis as a Q&A and a discussion. But I leave it to you, Rob, if you want to start off uh, with any kind of introduction or anything before I start out with setting out the issues and talk about the ongoing uh, very, very, you know, highly significant nuclear negotiations, which is ongoing in Vienna right now. Well, uh, 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 first of all, thank you, uh, Sadek, for such a generous um, uh, and, and really not so short uh, introduction. I just wanted to um, uh, make a slight clarification, with, uh, which may uh, be, uh, in a way, 
my fault for some of the information I gave you. I actually was not myself the Canadian ambassador for disarmament at the time, but in fact, um, uh, you know, the um, advisor uh, to the ambassador, uh, Alan Beasley, who uh, was actually a great international lawyer, uh, uh, better known really for the law of the sea. Now, thanks very much for that clarification. Uh, so uh, let's get Rob, let's get started uh, on the uh, issue that we wanted to, let's get right into it. So setting out the issues, uh, what I wanted to talk about, so as you know, there's been two rounds of negotiations currently in, in Vienna after the new government of Iran came to power. So the seventh round and the eighth round. So the seventh round was uh, not apparently very successful or didn't create any results, which was expected given the new government coming into power with a new position, harder position, trying to extract more concessions. And the eighth round, apparently, there has been some progress with the help of Russia and China that we want to discuss today. Uh, previous to that, there was six rounds of talks uh, to revive the JCPOA, which is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or the nuclear deal uh, with the five plus one countries uh, since Biden came to power. So a little bit of background to that. Obviously, JCPOA was concluded in 2015. Um, and after that, uh, just a year after that, uh, Trump came to power uh, with the campaign promise to, to basically uh, withdraw from the deal, which he did eventually in 2018. So in 2018, not only did Trump withdraw, withdrew, withdraw from the deal, but also started his campaign, maximum pressure campaign on Iran. And so with uh, Pompeo uh, as um, Secretary, Secretary of State, they really initiated, uh, like, I think it's like 1,500 sanctions or targeted 1,500 people. Um, and, and so added to the pressure. And eventually this led to Iran also after a year uh, from withdrawal to start backtracking uh, some of its obligations under the JCPOA. Now, here we are. Uh, and negotiations are ongoing. Um, and so I, 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 we don't know what's going to happen. There are big hurdles that we want to talk today. Uh, and I suggest, Rob, that we can talk about legal hurdles, uh, political hurdles. There's a number of them. You've written a number of articles on this, but your, your two recent articles, one on guarantees that Iran is demanding, guarantee from the Biden administration that this will not happen again with Professor Rudy Taitol that I wanted to, to discuss, and also your other one that talks about the sticking issues of, uh, again, uh, not only on guarantees, but also um, on other uh, uh, issues like the alternative scenarios that could happen and all of that. So if you agree, we start with uh, some of the legal hurdles, or if you want to set the context and start doing that, uh, there are really a big, big hurdles legally, as I see it. Uh, one is what, which one of the sanctions that Trump imposed in Iran would have to be removed as they are tagged as nuclear sanctions versus non-nuclear sanctions. So that's a big issue as part of negotiations. There are inspection mechanisms, sunset provisions that some of which are going to take into effect next as soon as next year. So that's part of negotiations. Step-by-step -step verifications, uh, commitments by, by both sides. And also, uh, as I said, the issue of guarantees that we can discuss. So uh, up to you, Rob. Uh, let's let's get started on the legal side, and then get to the political hurdles and see. Eventually, to what extent do you think it's possible for, with uh, you know, regardless of all of these hurdles, for the parties to really get to the end result, which is reviving the JCPOA as it was back in 2015 as opposed to other scenarios, like having a temporary agreement, like a truce, as Russia has apparently suggested we've been hearing, or no agreement, and what would be the implications of them for uh, peace and security in the region? Okay, um, so these are great and fundamental uh, questions, and um, uh, an excellent uh, beginning to our discussion. But to frame that discussion, I'd like to just make a couple of big picture type points. Um, so the first is what happened after 
Trump basically um, uh, withdrew the U.S. or uh, repudiated uh, uh, the JCPOA. Um, and what happened was that um, Iran's um, nuclear program, especially the aspect of it of greatest concern uh, to the international community, um, uh, the enrichment of fuel uh, actually accelerated. And even though efforts by Israel and possibly covert efforts by the United States to sabotage that program, whether through um, you know, cyber war techniques or through um, assassinations of nuclear scientists seemed only to backtrack and um, increase the uh, will of the regime to push ahead uh, faster and, and farther. And so they did actually get to a point where at least with respect to some percentage, albeit probably a fairly small one, uh, they were uh, enriching uh, to uh, a small amount of the uranium to 60%. Uh, percent. And beyond that threshold, you're really getting into um, weapons grade um, enrichment. So uh, the Trump maximum pressure, and you already alluded to Trump not only reimposing the sanctions that were lifted with um, the, J the original JCPOA, uh, but also new sanctions, the maximum pressure policy was a grandiose fa failure. Grandiose in the sense that on its own terms, um, it actually had the impact of greatly accelerating I Iran's nuclear, um, uh, nuclear development. Um, so, uh, Biden gets elected as president, and in his campaign, one of his uh, campaign points is that, in fact, um, this was a terrible mistake by, by Trump. The United States was breaking its word, and the ultimate result is the one that I just described, that it completely backfired in terms of the non-proliferation objective or the objective of, of, of restraining I Iran uh, from moving forward with its nuclear program in such a way that it would come a lot closer to being able to produce a bomb. And here I want to back up. There's very little evidence that the Iranian leadership has ever already chosen the path of weapon, weaponization. They, it's clear they want to have the choice that that's been their past strategy, but it's very unclear that they actually um, are, are, are taking that path. And both the CIA and the International Atomic Energy Agency, in fact, have seen no evidence of a decision point where the, you know, the, the regime has actually made the choice, now we're going to push ahead to an actual bomb. So instead of immediately uh, removing the sanctions and returning the U.S. to compliance with um, the JCPOA, the Biden administration hesitated. And the hesitation was really about the capture of the narrative uh, in the U.S., not by the, the sanctions of failed message, but by the alarming progress of the Iran nuclear program message. So the focus then you know, became, um, you know, um, this um, behavior of Iran rather than correcting or reversing the behavior of the United States. And so this provided a window of opportunity for the right uh, and, you know, uh, hardliners and think tanks and so on to say, this has gotten to the point where military options as have sometimes been proposed by Israel ought to be considered. It's, it's really not the point at which you sit down at the negotiating table. So there seem to have been different views on this within the administration, the Biden administration itself. And my sense is President Biden has you know at some point just decided to rule out the possibility that the U.S. would attack Iran militarily, and I think that was clearly the right choice. I'm sure that we that's one thing we can debate today. So having ruled that out, and um, Israel not probably being able with its current capabilities to set back 
the Iranian program more than a few months. And remember what we learned from the experiment of maximum pressure was how much know-how Iran had required so that you could pick off or <coughs> have a targeted killing of X or Y scientists or, or, or screw up uh, you know, some of the operating systems of, of one of the reactors or research sites. But ultimately, it didn't really matter because Iran had indigenized uh, enough know-how and technology to pick itself back off its feet uh, and, in fact, run faster. Um, so if, if the U.S. is not going to intervene militarily, and if we believe that Iran is really seeking the bomb, which uh, I think they never chose to do, but if one believes that the threat of that happening is an important international threat, and you're not going to intervene militarily, and sanctions have already failed, then you're inevitably uh, pushed back to the negotiating table. And I think that this was the decision-making calculus that led to those in favor of JCPO restoration within the expert community and within you know, the, the administration and uh, the Pentagon and so on, coming to a conclusion that the U.S.'s best option was to try and restore the nuclear deal, despite the fact that it would be more complicated in some ways because Iran had already, um, you know, uh, shown uh, that it had a degree of know-how and technical or technological capacity that would be difficult um, to roll back. So you could still mothball centrifuges and so on. But ultimately, if Iran decided, if its leaders decided that now they want the bomb, they're going to be able to, to go on that path and not really have it disrupted, except perhaps by something that's unthinkable to the Biden administration rightly, which would be a massive US strike using deep, deep penetration, penetrator bombs on Iran's nuclear facilities. So if that's off the table, and for good right. reasons it ought to be, then we have to have a different kind of table. And so ultimately that became the new negotiating table in uh, Vienna. Now on the Iran side, there, there, you know, there's the story, the kind of moral ideological story, the US has broken its word. Uh, where's the Biden administration's apology? Well, many of the officials have characterized Iran not performing the agreement, i.e. breaking out in response eventually uh, to Trump repudiating it as Iran breaching the JCPOA. But in fact, if you look at, I believe it's Article 26, uh, in the event of reimposition of sanctions, Iran reserved the right uh, to not be bound by the, the constraints on its nuclear program in the agreement. It's a kind of you know, self-help remedy that redresses the imbalance created by one party um, you know, reimposing the measures, the removal of which, which was the raison d'etre for Iran ever agreeing uh, to those constraints. So the Iranian narrative is a different one. And another narrative is connected to uh, the new government or new leadership that you mentioned, Sadak. Uh, and uh, I think they, they really were part of um, a constituency in Iran, you know, that that was not just, of course, uh, you know, worried about the fact the U.S. broke out and perhaps infuriated, and why did the agreement allow that? But I think also question whether the original agreement delivered the benefits it ought to, because while the sa the sanctions were lifted, uh, that were listed. Um, Many other measures, restrictive measures, remained in place. And the big promises, especially of the Europeans, that with the American sanctions lifted, um, that this they would really facilitate the you know the development of international trade and investment uh, with Iran. This did not come through. There was a kind of um, there was a kind of um, a very uh, uh, 
you know, a stinting uh, implementation in the sense that it didn't produce uh, huge benefits. So this time round, and this brings us to the question of guarantees, um, the new leadership having perhaps criticized the old for signing an agreement that where the benefits really didn't flow in the way that they were intended to, has to demonstrate to their own public and maybe just to their own consciences that this time they are going to ensure that the benefits come uh, from the agreement. And one threat to the benefits is if a future Republican president does what, what Trump does. Now, I'm less afraid of that than I am concerned about this issue of how do we make sure that serious benefits arise just by lifting the sanctions. And Sadek, I think you and I have all have already exchanged on social media. Yeah. One of the points you make is that a group of measures that's very important is the financial measures. These cross cut yeah. the nuclear, non-nuclear category. So you could lift some of the nuclear sanctions, but the financial restrictions uh, would, so in principle, trade would be possible, but if you still have the financial restrictions, um, the risks to entities trading using uh, systemically important financial institutions that are connected to U.S. financial institutions are considerable. And, and, and you know, uh, compliance folks in multinational corporations and banks, you know, take this very, very seriously. So, the question is how practically to bring the benefits. Um, and this is where the administration, I think, has actually uh, done something very sensible. Um, it was something I suggested uh, they do. I don't think they followed me in this particularly, but which was to bring other stakeholders in, like Russia, China, uh, some of the Gulf states, and say, look, you have a, you have a stake in both uh, avoiding an ultimate outcome where where Iran becomes a, a, a nuclear road state, that's not good for you, given the geography um, and your interest in the region. And you may also have an interest in profitable uh, trade and economic cooperation. So how can we lift sanctions now in such a way that Iran really believes that they're going to get benefits, and which transactions are actually going to be freed, um, which um, oil uh, routes are going to be now truly open, uh, and, and so on. And so in the piece that you referred to, the blog post with Ruchi Taitao, I mean, one of the suggestions we make for securing some of these transactions against backtracking, and backtracking might be more subtle than the kind of uh, dramatic event of a future president simply pulling out of the whole deal. It could be, um, you know, a, a very stinting approach in Treasury or a failure of some European country to properly uh, remove uh, restrictions or uh, or allow the flow of financial assets and so on. So all of this is the devil in the details, um, as I think the very active um, uh, Russian ambassador and, and representative to the talks, Ambassador Ulyanov, ha has pointed out. But the idea is to get um, kind of a menu of, of offerings where the Iranian leadership can say, look, this is going to give us benefits in the short term. They're really going to flow. And there's a certain de-risking of transactions that are very important to us from the possibility that uh, of non-compliance or only partial compliance or performance of the agreement or circumvention in the sense that another other sanctions or other restrictions on Iran undermine the possibility of, um, of using or exploiting the lifting of sanctions at a reasonable level of political risk or, or, or enforcement risk as judged by you know, multinational companies, banks, and so on. Uh, thanks very much for that, Rob. So um, let me just uh, take issue with some of the, so the big picture is, is very important. So we both, uh, I think we, we said at one point that we both went through this negotiation course, the, the Harvard, uh, you know, uh, project and negotiation. Yeah. Which, yeah, introduced the concept of BATS now, which is best alternative 
to a negotiated agreement. So I think from a realist perspective, I mean, what you talked about, I mean, obviously I agree with all of that, but, but if you want to take the perspectives of the US versus the perspectives uh, p- perspective of Iran. So that's one issue that we can look at. Um, so from an Iranian perspective, also we have the different factions within the Islamic Republic and we have the broader national interest. A lot of um, you know, uh, commentators, uh, you know, independent commentators in Iran believe that the nuclear program right from the start was not really worth pursuing all the costs with all the costs that is, is caused on the Iranian economy and isolation. So that's one of the big issues that has been debated in Iran. But it's been used as a way to leverage Iran, some people argue, back into the, into the global economy because Iran has been always sanctions right after the, you know, uh, the, the revolution and the hostage taking and all of that. So, so, that's one argument that it's been a defensive mechanism to leverage it to go back to the international community and to remove fully remove the sanctions. But also there are other people who argue that no, there has been other agendas or factions within the system that think that this is this gives you know uh, as you said the the accessibility uh, the possibility of uh, of of uh, you know building a bomb not necessarily being building one which is against the fatwa of the supreme leader but the possibility of being within the reach of that is something that is not defensive anymore but it actually allows iran to pursue its regional you know uh, program its ambitious regional program which they call you know um, the Shia Crescent, right? So these are these are the views uh, that we have from different, like independent commentators who think the whole thing doesn't make sense from the start, uh, and then the, the the different views, like you could call it reformers' views and the more like hardliner views on the issue. And to, to me, as a, a negotiations expert, the question is, what is your alternative? or best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So what do you have? Is this really a leverage? If, uh, to what extent is this really leverage? The, the, the approach that you took, which is a number of commentators, like um, progressives, pro-peace commentators in the West take, is that, listen, there's no other scenario. Either we have to go to a war or we have to come to an agreement like JCPOA to limit Iran's program contain Iran's nuclear program and there's no other way so we have to make concessions to get to that uh, my I mean I generally agree with that but my I, I add a nuance to that argument which is important which is to what extent really this is an Iran versus US issue because now it's come to a point where Russia and China has also a very you know a very a vested interest in making sure that Iran doesn't go toward nuclear bomb, which makes the job of the U.S. easier. Now you see Russia, you know, Ambassador Rapkov uh, in Vienna and others, really they are brokering a deal that might even turn out to be a temporary deal, not completely reviving JCPOA. And they're, to, from my understanding, they're putting pressure on the apparently hard, hardliner uh, new government to, to make concessions in order to do that. So the question is, to what extent really, um, this has, has, has been a leverage, you know, to what extent you can take the whole economic development of the country and the whole, uh, you know, um, other aspects of, a, of, a, of, of, of uh, the Iranian politics and society hostage by a nuclear program that has eventually not produced any results in terms of being a leverage if you want it. Even the JCPOA, let me backtrack on that. I was there when it was negotiated. I was I even sat with uh, Javad Zarif in one of the important economic um, negotiations. And what they had in mind, the team, the Rouhani team uh, initially had in mind was that the, the sanctions will be really removed, effectively removed. That's that's the standpoint that they had. And, and I was trying to give a sense that that was, yeah. you know, a disappointed expectation. Exactly. I mean, Javad Zarif told me once at the sideline of a meeting that 
uh, these, that was really like a couple of months after the JCPOA was, was implemented, that the banks should now start opening LCs, letters of credit. Why is it not, not happening? It's only like psychological and it's not really John Kerry had promised him that this would happen. Never happened. I was in the Iran trade promotion organization at the time as a vice president. I was only a negotiator and advisor, but they gave me the title of vice president to have more effect in my negotiations to um, you know, help Iran accede to the World Trade Organization, which has to do with your article with Ruji title. I will talk to that about, to, to speak to that as well. So I, we were receiving hundreds of missions from all, literally every single country maybe in the world, except for Israel and a couple of others. And they were all coming with enthusiasm to make investments in Iran. And then they realized after a few months that there's essential problems here. The JCPOA, the banking channels are not going to be open effectively. OFAC is still in the picture and there's a lot of problems. And in fact, before the JCPOA, we wrote the letter. I mean, I, did, I wrote the letter and the, my minister signed to Javad Zarif that your approach which we call a negative approach, just getting preparing a list of sanctions that would be removed and including them in the JCPOA would not effectively remove sanctions because there are all these, as you call it, complex web of financial sanctions that is effectively would be make the whole thing, the whole JCPOA without any actual benefit. But the problem, uh, Rob, uh, is perceived by the Iranian politicians as something, as you said, like uh, the, the Americans have deceived Iran and they're bad people. We said they're imperialists. I think that's nonsense. From an Iranian's perspective, I really don't care if, Iran, if the US is imperialist. Of course it is. But that's none of my business. It's always been like imperialism is part of your, you know, the realism of international politics. The question is, what do you do with it? in order to help Iranian, ordinary Iranians life better. And so you have to live with the reality. And that's why I come to the question of leverage. To what extent do we really want to leverage this nuclear program in order to get everything that you want and not even including other items in the agenda uh, of negotiations? I think the only way, and I will conclude with that uh, and I'll get back to you, but I think the only way for Iran to really and meaningfully get back to the international global economy is having a comprehensive negotiation agenda with the US resolving all the issues that are there. And this is not the approach that was taken by the JCPOA. That was a single-sided issue, just focusing on the security and nuclear disarmament uh, approach. And the sanctions removal aspect of it, therefore, was very limited and ineffective. And that's why this current negotiations are also even more limited in scope. And I believe, I sincerely believe that we will see it in a couple of weeks or months, that whatever results that will be produced will be even less effective than the 2015 deal for obvious reasons that we can discuss. You, you mean less effective in the sense that fewer transactions will be in the real world, uh, in fact, enabled uh, by the deal? Absolutely, for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, because, so I think for the Iranian economy, it's been really, uh, you know, it's really in a bad, bad ruin, and they need to have access to the oil proceeds. So there's uh, quite a few billion dollars in the Korean banks that they're waiting for US to, to free and all, all of that. And I think the leverage of Iran over, since Trump, since JCPOA and after that, since Trump has been diminishing over time, not increasing. That's the main point, because the Western commentators think that because Iran has started to ramp up and ratchet up uranium enrichment from 20% to 60%, they're getting closer to a bomb and therefore their leverage is increasing. And I think that's not the case. One for one, Russia and China would never allow Iran to get to that point. And Iran is, Iran's only lifeblood, uh, you know, to its economy is Russia and China. And so it's not to the interests of Russia and China for Iran to build a bomb or to, to, to go down, down that path or, you know, go out of the NPT and all of that. And then we see that, uh, you know, even the, 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 another reason for that is FATF, Financial Action Task Force. So one of the problems that we had in 2015, and I, again, I was part of those discussions was that 
we were really not serious in thinking through all the scenarios. So Iran was on a blacklist of FATF, which means that even if, even if the US would really and actually and effectively remove sanctions and OFAC would cooperate, the FATF blacklist list would take some time for Iran to update its anti-money laundering protocols and all of that. And Iran was not ready for that. Now, over the past couple of years, Iran has been back was suspended, but now it's been back to the blacklist and it takes at least two more years for Iran to do that. And it's never going to happen with the current administration, which means that again, nothing on the financial and banking side will happen. Political climate, you know better than there's going to be congressional elections in November and then the presidential election. There is no prospect for all. There's no prospect for investors, foreign investors to come in and really do anything. And in 2015, they had that high hope and it immediately, like in a short period of time with Trump co coming back to power, it was shattered. My argument is that yes, Trump definitely, uh, uh, you know, anything, I mean, whatever he did, he, he, he broke it, uh, we broke the promises or whatever, but that's, that's none of our business. I mean, we can discuss that from an international political standpoint, moral standpoint, international legal standpoint, definitely a violation of Uni United Nations Security Council resolution. But from an Iranian standpoint, what Trump did was he used the leverage that the JCPOA and the afterwards of it, which was Iran getting rid of all of its stockpile and sending it out to Russia, had given to the U.S. Now, Biden might, again, leverage, you know, um, you know, the position of the U.S. to come back to some sort of a deal. But the future U.S. president, I'm sure that they will use, even, even if they don't withdraw from the JCPOA, they will use everything in the JCPOA to do what, what they did, which is pressuring up, building up pressure against Iran and containing Iran. And that's the reality of the geopolitics in the region, unless Iran makes a completely different decision with respect to its foreign policy. That's what my honest belief. I've been part of the, you know, the administ administration for a couple of years. And I think this is a two-way street and it could start with Iran taking a completely opposite approach, opening up to the world, which means the US and trying to change its policies towards all the countries in the regions. And it's a realistic standpoint. I mean, I'm not saying that that's, that's good or bad. Obviously I think it's good, but that's the only way for Iran to meaningfully negotiate anything that would have impact uh, positive impact in the sustainable in a sustainable way, way for Iran. So that's why I take issue with some of the things that you say because I think there are a number of hurdles. I think they will come up with something, but that will not long live. That would not be long lived, and it would only impoverish even further the Iranian economy over time. Maybe short term, it will pour some money into the hands of some certain people in the Iranian, uh, you know, political elite or the economy somehow but it won't be long lived and it won't really help Iran grow sustainably over time. That's, that's what I think. I don't know if, if that's something you agree with or you, you think it's, it's um, I'm a little bit pessimistic over here. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me to be, to be quite you know, plausible uh, because while sanctions have obviously hurt, um, you know, Iranians and the economy. Um, the uh, the problems of the economy are far from only due to sanctions, um, and have a lot to do with governance failures um, that are the responsibility of the Iranian political system. Uh, so, um, it, the but the what is the horizon of of political of political leaders, um, I think that's the question one has to ask. And you know, from the uh, from the perspective of Iran's leaders, um, a a deal which front ends a certain amount of sanctions relief, freezing a non-trivial, unfreezing a non-trivial quantity of assets and gives a reasonable avenue for uh, transactions with Russia, China, perhaps even some Gulf states <coughs> where 
there are enough actors still prepared to take a certain risk or to use financial channels that are not so much on the radar screen or that can be ignored, quote unquote, by the US Treasury, is that enough to get the leadership to think, okay, this is worth our while? Um, and you know, that's really, I think you're pointing out the decision. If 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 if, if Iran's leaders really wanted, you know, truly a solution that integrates Iran into the global economy and is a game changer for Iran's economy, I I totally agree with you. They would be focused on many other things uh, than just the nuclear, you know, the new using the nuclear leverage. I also agree with you, by the way, that the leverage has, you know, has declined. It, in some sense, you know, uh, Iran was the victim of its own success, which is that um, its nuclear program, you know, gave rise to um, a view in the West, which was heavily fueled by Israel under Netanyahu, that this was the top threat of, in the region, uh, Iran's nuclear program. Mm. Uh, so uh, as a result, um, you know, people came to the negotiating table. Uh, Obama argued that it's a crucial, it's an imperative that Iran never get a nuclear bomb. And so we have to sit down and negotiate and we have to put sanctions on them. And then, you know, it's a carrot and stick approach, then offer to take them off if they, restrain their their nuclear program but you know there was a, a poll released just a few weeks ago that only 23 percent of the israeli public believe iran is an immediate uh, security threat uh, to israel now you know netanyahu is gone the um the current prime minister who also comes out of the political right goes through the motions of saying Iran is terrible, our main you know, security objective is to harm Iran and so on, but there isn't the same uh, force behind it. And a lot of uh, you know, um, Israeli security and defense officials, some of them retired, but now even some of them not retired, uh, but in office have come forward saying either that this threat is greatly exaggerated or you know we can't do anything about it militarily and we should kind of you know more or less relax obviously you know there's an expression in in medicine watchful waiting you know if iran were yeah. to move towards you know actual weaponization then you know we might have to do something but you know so the leverage is gone down uh, by virtue of the fact of a reassessment uh, of the exaggerated claims by Netanyahu, and, and also, I think, a reassessment even in terms of how much priority Barack Obama gave right. to the importance to global security of halting Iran's nuclear program. So what happens if there's no deal? I mean, yeah, the, that's the question. it might be, you know, Biden is not going to attack, attack Iran. You will have uh, people on the political right in the United States suggesting that an attack, um, you know, it, it now is the way to go. Others will claim that maximum pressure didn't work because it wasn't maximum, and that we should, you know, to the extent possible, just increase the sanctions. I mean, what if the Biden administration were to do nothing? I mean, to say, you know, um, we will cross the bridge of, we of weaponization it, it, once Iran makes that decision. They haven't made that decision. We, the U.S., are a superpower, and we can work with China, Russia, others. Believe, believe us that if if we see that that if our intelligence agencies see that Iran is making the decision that it's going to build the bomb we have the time to react decisively. And, and again, this is one area where we see uh, the same uh, uh, as Russia and China. So mm -hmm. we don't really have to worry about them getting a bomb. Um, increasing the sanctions, well, that, that might just create a counter reaction where 
they actually do something stupid and start to enrich to 90% just as a, a revenge kind of measure or tit for tat kind of thing. So we'll leave the sanctions on. Uh, we'll take the military option off the table. And, and you know, we will just live with what you describe as a status quo that seems almost implicit in certain decisions that Iran's leaders have made about the kind of foreign policy and economic strategy or non-strategy that they're choosing to pursue. And, you know, in a way, you know, I, I would be comfortable myself with that. I think politically for Biden, um, uh, it, it will make the Iran file a perpetual distraction uh, because there will be pressures from some elements in Israel, some elements in the United States, uh, you know, to do something, to make some threats, and to continue to distract the administration. If, 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 if a deal can be done, even with reasonably decent optics and front-loading some meaningful sanctions relief, uh, then Biden can say, first of all, he's fulfilled a campaign promise. Um, secondly, he's uh, rolled back one of the worst decisions of the Trump administration that led to uh, an alarming escalation uh, uh, of Iran's nuclear program. And, and third, he's vindicated what Democrats view as, as one of Barack Obama's most important foreign policy achievements. And perhaps most importantly, uh, he can leave, you know, the right and the left to fight it out in Congress and move out on to other issues. And believe me, there are plenty of those right, right. on the table, including foreign policy issues. So I think the uh, the U.S. politics, the politics uh, uh, in terms of the choices that face Biden, um, almost any deal would be better than walking away with failure and, and sort of keeping the Iran issue, nuclear issue kind of stewing on the pot uh, in the American uh, political landscape. But from the point of view of US security and global security, I think it's quite possible you know, to live with a status quo type outcome. And indeed, you mentioned a partial deal. I'm not sure whether a partial deal was what was being vetted by Russia so much as an arrangement where to deal with the trust problem where the US would take off some sanctions, then Iran would move its program back or some kind of sequencing, a, a kind of step-by-step -step approach, you know, which we see right in, in, in private law sometimes where two parties don't trust each other. You know, one party, performs partially, uh, the other party releases a tranche, yeah. uh, a performance payment, often construction and large infrastructure projects work that way. Uh, it could have been something similar. But, but even if there's no deal, the Biden administration can have almost like secret uh, kind of arrangement with the Iranians that, for example, okay, make sure you don't enrich too much uranium at 60%, don't ever go above, and we'll be relatively nice. Under the radar screen, we'll license certain transactions, give you waivers. It's already happening. There. It's already happening to a lot Exactly, of exactly. It's already happening. And so this is a method of kind of keeping, uh, you know, a lid on a pot, yeah. but, but stopping the pot from boiling by an agreement, at least yeah. that will, I think, certainly last out the Biden administration, yeah. probably somewhat beyond it, um, at, at a minimum, is the best political option for Biden. And, and it's certainly an option that all things considered is good for US, uh, US security. Yeah, and, and, and also the fact that the Iranian economy is really in a very, very bad shape and Iran has not so many options. I mean, does it can't even go and turn to Russia and China because they would be saying, you have to go back and negotiate and they would be putting pressure on Iran. 
And so and, uh, every single economist, in, uh, Iranian economist or, uh, you know, outsider, uh, economists from outside think that if there's no deal and if the U.S. goes back to Trump era sanctions, there will be really, uh, really significant conflict, uh, consequences for the Iranian economy, which is already in ruins. So Iran doesn't have, and that's exactly what I was saying. So Iran doesn't have a lot of leverage, has some leverage, but doesn't have a lot of leverage to, to prolong discussions or leave the table. For the US, uh, do you agree? There was this article recently that, a uh, uh, Bloomberg article that said that, you know, this is not going, some, going to be a determinant on Biden's reelection chances. Like nobody really cares at the end of the day if there's going to be a revival or not in terms of increasing or decreasing Biden's chances for re-election, they will use it anyway, either way, you know, if, even if you know, he enters into a deal or not enter into a deal, they will use it against him, but it won't really have an impact, a meaningful impact on his re-election. Do you agree with that? Um, you know, um, there are two dimensions to this. One is the question of whether, you know, foreign policy issues that don't, kind of immediately affect, you know, people in ways that they can see uh, the immediate effect are ever going to be determinative in the election. And there are foreign policy issues like trade and immigration where people feel a, a very direct interest. They may be mistaken about what the, their interest is, but they feel a very direct interest. I mean, on Iran, you know, it's this is really a product of you know the Washington you know think tank world, and uh, frankly, in in the past, and this is why this would be less true, I think, today than before. You know, a kind of immense global effort by uh, you know Netanyahu and his associates um, in close coordination with um, you know. With U.S. organizations and and the Republican Party, and uh, neoconservative think tanks and commentators, to place Iran front and center as a joint or common enemy of the United States and Israel. Well, you know, um, there's such a thing as enemy overload. I mean, the United States now realizes that if I don't like the word enemy, but uh, the China rivalry is usually important. Right, exactly. You would have to be a fool uh, to think that Iran, as a rival or enemy of the United States, is a, of, of, of uh, anything approaching the significance of China. I mean, I think most people in America do think. I mean, I, I hope we don't view China as an enemy, but I think it's uh, there's a level of realism even in the general public that they're rivals and their geopolitical interests are going to clash with ours in, in many respects. And now we've kind of turned Russia into an enemy as well. So we may be approaching enemy saturation or uh, overload. But and, and, and of course, Netanyahu is now preoccupied with keeping himself out of jail. And it turns out that um, although he claimed and he was referred often to as King Bibi, to speak for all of Israel. And sometimes he would even say all of the Jewish people, which was an incredibly arrogant and absurd thing to say, that, that Iran is this crucial threat. I mean, now that he's kind of out of the, you know, he's not out of politics, that would be an exaggeration, but he's definitely been sidelined and out of, you know, out of the prime minister's office, a wide range of views is emerging in Israel about Iran, and also that the Israeli public, as I say, with that recent poll, doesn't really believe that they're, you know, that they're going to be terrorized by Iran. Twenty-three percent—that's pretty small, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and I mean, uh, so going back to what you said about uh, Rabkov's, uh, Ambassador Rabkov, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rabkov's uh, comments. Yes, it's a step-by-step -step approach. And that's what I meant by it. like a, it looks like a temporary deal with you do something, I do something, and then we see what happens next. And uh, so Israel's position on that, what do you think of that? Do you think, uh, I, my understanding is that they're happy with, I mean, mostly they were mostly happy with the JCPOA too. I mean, they were making a lot of noise, but they were happy that the chances of Iran becoming a nuclear threat 
was diminished or you know really minimized. But they wanted to get more leverage, and they put pressure on Trump uh, to 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 even get more. And I was discussing and arguing at the time I was in Iran. I was arguing that of course Trump would withdraw from the deal, uh, and Netanyahu was pressuring them because Iran has has lost its rev leverage. You know, it, it has lost its stockpile. It has lost what it had, but it hasn't gained from uh, economically as much as it had. Not that you know the U.S. tricked Iran, which it did. But because Iran negotiated wrongly, Iran has, has, has had to negotiate in a comprehensive and open-minded way, putting everything on the table. So going back to what I said, but generally from an Israel standpoint, so Israel has been uh, launched a number of covert actions on Iranian nuclear facilities, scientists, they will continue doing that. I think Russia might even help Israel by that, that's one factor that is always ignored in, in um, some of your even comments, Rob, honestly, that, that Russia, even if U.S. pivots- I don't to have a Asia, high enough security clearance to know whether that's true or not. <laughs> no, 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 I don't, I don't either. But, but the geopolitics of a region is, a region is such that, oh, Netanyahu had a very good relationship, as far as I could understand, with Putin. And Israel has really, um, great relationship with Russia, Rob. I was negotiating a trade agreement with Euro-Asian Economic Union, basically Russia and four other countries. And we never concluded that, just concluded a temporary agreement. But Israel was on a trade perspective, talking about trade, was much far, far more advanced. And uh, Israel's relationship with Russia is really, really robust. It's really robust at the United Nations Security Council and elsewhere. And I think even if U.S. as it has been pivoting to Asia, going to uh, you know paying attention and, and and turning its focus on China, even if it leaves all the region to whatever you know the countries are there, Iran would be contained by Russia anyway. There won't be any actual or really serious threat against Israel. That's what we saw in Syria. So Iran went into Syria before that Iraq did a lot of things, but eventually Russia came in, took leadership and contained Iran. And that's what, what's always happening with Iran. Iran doesn't have as much leverage as it's portrayed outside of Iran and as it's portrayed inside Iran by the, by the, by the, by the hardliners. And so that's, that's why I think the geopolitics of a region, a region and the Russia's role in all of this is something that we have to pay more attention to. Um, uh, yeah, so so that's that's what I wanted. So if if you have any any like sort of a summing up or what do you think what's going to happen? I want to open up up to questions as well in the like for the last 20, 25 minutes to the audience. Uh, but I think I tried to make some of the I mean uh, differences of opinion that I have, which is like basically perspectives. I agree with most of the, the what what you said, but it's differences of perspectives from an Iranian side, because Rob, that's one important thing is that a lot of things that you say and you comment on or write on Twitter, on, 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 on blogs, the, those Iranian commentators who are pro, uh, let's say this way, they are pro hawkish approach from Iran. They think that this is a leverage that Iran has to use. And some of them are even advocating for Iran building a bomb they retweet you, and I get worried and say, "No, that's not what Rob's position is." <laughs> you know, yeah, that's yeah. I, that's absolutely not what Rob's position. Because, but, but by by putting like sort of portraying the U.S. as the only culprit here, which is obviously an internal political debate and issues there, which you are entangled with, and Israel as well, the right wing in Israel. Uh, sometimes we forget that the problem is multifaceted and that we do we also have serious problems in the way that the Iranian politics is formulated. And obviously you agree with that, I think. Yes, so, I, 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 yeah. complete, I, I mean, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, to my mind, um, as I say, the, um, the you know, you know um, one thing I've learned from, you know, the occasions more when I was, you mentioned my early diplomatic career in Canada, but but since I occasionally uh, get involved in advising, you know, politicians, uh, you know, people who actually are, you know, at that, you know, at that decision making level. And one thing I really observed is how differently politicians 
look at issues um, than than officials and and experts. Um, and it's and it's interesting. It, this is not about democracy versus authoritarianism. It's it's the mindset of people who are um, uh, you know um, elected or if not truly elected. Um, uh, thinking every moment about, you know, the people they depend on to stay in power. That thought right. never leaves their mind. I mean, they That's could right. be the most idealistic or intellectual, uh, you know, uh, politicians. And Pierre Trudeau, for whom uh, I did work when I was very young, as you mentioned, was a great intellectual. But on the Euro missile issue, for example, you know, his personal relationship with Helmut Schmidt and 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 you know some of the other relationships he had with other powerful political figures who um canada had an interest uh in um in, in cooperating with it's very important so it's a somewhat different way of thinking and since i've never been there myself right. i appreciate it's yeah. a different way yeah. of thinking but i'm yeah, not that's a, that's my experience you know with the, yeah. but you, you know it, we can't, I, well, one thing I won't predict is how the ultimate political decision, you know, in Iran will come out. I think that if, if the Iranian leadership gives Biden anything to work with, um, he will support a deal because the way I could construct, you know, his political universe, he only gains by, by taking, uh, you know, this pot off, off the stove. Um, at least through his entire administration. Now, the question will be whether he wants to leverage it for some other kind of gains, which might be more important. And you alluded to that earlier, which is to, you know, to perhaps explore, maybe through Qatar or other intermediaries, the possibility that Iran could be incentivized to you know, to engage in significant regional security discussions and some kind of dialogue about its foreign policy and the mess that exists in Yemen and Syria and, and so on. And the any deal will only involve lifting nuclear sanctions. And you alluded earlier to an issue we didn't really get a chance to discuss a legal issue. And that's my fault because I forgot to discuss it. But we should bring the audience in now. Yeah, uh, yeah. But nuclear versus non-nuclear. But suffice it to say that on any scenario, there will be a lot of sanctions left in place. Yeah. And therefore, true. a lot of further leverage uh, if the Biden administration wants to attempt to use it to push Iran to think its leaders to think about, you know, whether they can do better somehow in terms of their own interests through uh, what I would call a somewhat less um, uh, mischievous and disruptive role from the point of view of, of regional, uh, regional security. And maybe, uh, obviously that role suits the interests of the Revolutionary Guards very well, but it may not serve of uh, the any more the interests of other elements in the in the Iranian leadership, but as I say, I don't have a high enough security clearance to, <laughs> to tell you much about that. Thanks, and I, I look forward to uh, yeah. questions from uh, our participants. Yes, yeah, so let's open up. Uh, I don't know if there's been uh, uh, Liel, if you want to help me see the, the hands, if there's any there are any hands raised for questions. one of the participants, Yusuf, had a question. Okay, let's let's uh, have Yusuf ask his question, please. Oh, hello everyone, hello Dr. Uh, Big Gelly and Dr. Hauser. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so my question about the point that um, Sadr mentioned earlier, uh, if Iran comes to the comprehensive uh, negotiation with the United States, uh, we might have a sense of that. Okay, everything gonna uh, solve and you know the sanctions all remove and the United States people United States entities can come to Iran and you know invest in Iran uh, but but uh, due to the fact that um, I believe and you know uh, I think um, all of the scholars believe that uh, the, the, the JCPOA designed as the first step 
uh, for going through the, you know, the regional talk to the security talk to the missile talks and everything else. But uh, this uh, untrust and mistrust between Iran and the United States, it happened since 1952, maybe, or 1979. Everyone has uh, his own insights about that. But, but this, what's happening through the JCPOA after Trump withdrew from the deal, uh, I think it deepened this mistrust. And, and um, in reality, I didn't see that the, you know, the Iranian officials uh, coming very soon to this fact, okay, if we go through the comprehensive negotiation, uh, we would see much more beautiful world in the future. But, but on the other hand, this is, this is one point. On the other hand, uh, I wanted to see from the, uh, the United States law and the, uh, the, the dynamics that we can see in Washington, DC. Even if the, you know, the Biden administration can get the treaty from Senate, even if we don't, we, we know that it's gonna, it's not gonna happen. But uh, even if no, it's I, I don't gonna think happen, that there is convincing the Iran of this, what's going on? So, so my question is that, uh, you know, isn't going to be changed anything in the United if it is treaty, uh, the, the the next president of the United States should abide with treaty, or he or she can change any part of that. Thank you. It, it's not going to be a treaty. Um, I mean, President Biden knows full well that um, you know the current uh, configuration of the Senate. Um, you know that I mean, there's already one Democrat who's um, you know kind of um, uh, laid down the gauntlet uh, against um, uh, what the administration appears to be negotiating. Um, uh, one Democrat in the Senate, um, Menendez. And so, you know, it would be, and it would also be counterproductive because uh, by being in the position of trying to get this through the Congress or in the case of a treaty, uh, is a supermajority consent in the Senate. I mean, Biden would be setting himself up to be a loser, having won diplomatically, he would be setting himself up for a political loss. I come and came back to this perspective of politicians. So it's not going to be a treaty. Uh, I can, that's for sure. Uh, whatever uh, protocols or understandings or lists uh, that are agreed, um, uh, may or may not be, uh, you know, annexed to a new Security Council resolution. I mean, that's a possibility with, um, in the case of, um, you know, having, you know, the uh, agreement of, uh, you know, of the P5, you know, so, um, uh, uh, so that's a possibility, but the real security is not going to come from international law. And I, I hate to say this because I make my living as an international lawyer, but I also make it uh, sometimes advising people that international law as such will not solve your problem. Um, here, um, you know, it, it will come from, um, you know, uh, ways of de-risking transactions um, and, and front-loading enough benefits that, you know, if, an, if the next administration reverses, uh, you know, that there will still be uh, uh, significant gains uh, as perceived by the Iranian leadership. And some transactions might be secured. And Professor Titel and I made some suggestions as you might use the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or some uh, mechanism that works outside the US financial system largely. Um, to provide political risk insurance or trade credits or whatever. So you take some of the financial facilitation of transactions outside of the orbit of the, of, you know, the US dominated uh, financial system and into a, an alternative financial universe. And that's becoming more and more possible. I mean, uh, I also work on international financial relations and law and sovereign debt. And you see various kinds of swaps between different countries of currency. I mean, there's a, I mean, everybody talks about crypto, but even aside from crypto, there are various ways of operating sophisticated transactions outside of, uh, of the formal financial system. And I think this goes to Sadek's point about like Russia and China. Um, 
to some extent, there they will be very happy with the deal because it will facilitate. But you know, if Iran thinks that they're counting on them, one would have to ask why have they not to this point been you know really inventive in facilitating transactions outside of the U.S. financial system? I mean, there are ways in which they can do it. Uh, and expand on it, um, uh, and because they they're they're big players, and um, they um, can easily you know at very large scale, and they're already doing this at some scale, engage yeah, in, yeah. in counter trade, for example. So, uh, so there are a lot of questions here, but but the bottom line is it will not be a treaty, and even if it were a treaty, my understand I'm not a U.S. constitutional expert, but my understanding in talking to people like. For example, uh, Professor Una Hathaway at Yale, uh, who is such an expert on the foreign relations of the United States, and to Ruti Taital, who teaches constitutional law as well as international law, that, um, that, uh, that there is a doctrine that, in fact, Congress, if, if there's a congressional legislation that's even in contradiction to a treaty, um, uh, that it, it can be, it can, it can override or would be viewed by the courts as, as superior to, you know, a treaty uh, uh, obligation, because in U.S. domestic law, a treaty obligation uh, has the status of law of the United States. That's the effect of making something a treaty. But then, what about, can a subsequent law of the United States um, you know, effectively overturn obligations in a treaty. If, if a treaty is not constitutionalized by being consented yeah. to the Senate. So you still have that problem. But the, the fact is that the folks in the Biden administration, fortunately, the sanctions folks, you know, know this stuff inside out. And so I'm sure they're extremely careful to be offering sanctions relief or ancillary relief that is clearly within the discretionary power of the executive. And so I'm sure that they have looked at each of these statutory authorities for sanctions very carefully to, to make sure that what they're offering uh, can be done without having to um, amend uh, the, uh, in Congress uh, the, the statutory framework for Iran sanctions, the you know, but but uh, and so that that's what would ma makes a deal possible that could be a political win for the Biden administration in the short term. But the downside of that, or the or the flip side, or the uh, you know the, the uh, you know the other edge of the sword, or whatever metaphor you want to use, is that that means again that a future administration could. Uh, could could reverse this because if you're acting with an executive authority, then you know it, uh, I, I don't want to be too definitive here because I'm not an American administrative or constitutional law expert, but I'm channeling what I hear from the experts that it can be reversed by another act of executive uh, authority. But what enables the administration to go to Vienna and make you know credible offers is knowing that those offers can be implemented by executive action. Um, and because uh, the administration is operating correctly within the discretion that it's provided under the relevant statutory authorities. Therefore, Rob, there's no guarantee from an international legal perspective, U.S. perspective, that, that the U.S. could provide, even passing, uh, passing, you know, can't never be passed by a Congress, even this Congress, but well, even I, if it But could. we have to, I mean, this yeah. is something that, you know, is always a, a tricky thing when you're teaching international law to have people yeah. distinguish between exactly. the, the legal security for an international agreement in the domestic constitutional domestic or administrative yeah. law system yeah. And the bindingness or the legal security at the plane of international law. Right. There is no question that if this were a treaty, it would be binding on the United States in international law. It could be binding on the United States in international law, even uh, if it's not a treaty. Yeah. As a resolution of the U.S. Yeah. Constitution, and yeah. Yeah. and there are many many 
sole executive agreements or, or uh, congressional executive agreements, as you know, working in the trade field, that's how trade agreements are negotiated. I mean, did, I mean, you know, uh, what's the status of the, of the, the trade agreement that the Trump negotiated with Japan or the phase one China oh. agreement, you know, so, but, but at the international plane, the, the most unproblematic way of, of making this binding uh, international legal security is through um, is through a, um, a resolution of the Security Council, basically. But even that could be violated like the previous time by Trump. I mean, there's, there's nothing really legally speaking that could but, stop but the US know, using its leverage. Right? You know, there's no, in this sense, you know, everything is politics. I mean, this will get us into yeah. a discussion of critical legal theory, yeah. uh, which I'm sure is banned in some parts of the United States. Uh, but, but um, you know, uh, there are no absolute guarantees in political life, especially in international relations, but what? But you know, a Security Council resolution is a powerful expression, uh, you know, uh, backed by the P5, um, of a sense that these these should be legally secure uh, commitments. And so, uh, a renegade president, uh, someone like Trump, could walk away and say, "What's the UN Security Council?" But there are costs to that, and and and. Uh, that's the most, you know, that one can do. But Iran is taking that into account, Rob, because last time it happened and that the next election cycle, Tom Cotton or Pompeo or other potential presidential candidates could uh, come to power with the same agenda. And so, so th that's why I think that the talk of the guarantees would be more to me. I mean, I, that's my difference uh, of, your, of opinion with yourself in your article, that that's something of a gesture maybe from Biden's administration, but if from a really perspective i don't see any of those i mean we can't discuss it one by one but uh, on the wto side wto membership of iran i was in charge of it it's never going to happen with the current climate political climate with iran that's too bad that's yeah that's 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 yeah. the case i mean i but, was, but, I, was but, but I just i just want to make one point on the guarantees yeah. issue i mean we've been talking about things like political risk insurance working through right. The China Infrastructure Bank and so and, on. You know. I mean, you know, you have to admit that, you know, private law, it's not even private law, but but these kinds of commercial models for guarantees are, are less elusive in a way or illusory than pursuing the idea of international legal security as such. Um, and, you know, in fact, you know, Titel and I suggest possibly arbitration, um, binding arbitration. So uh, on the on the model of the US Iran Claims Tribunal, maybe yeah. putting um, you know a billion or two of frozen assets into into uh, an escrow fund and um, and then um, you know um, uh, allowing uh, uh, the United States to be sued in arbitration yeah. and and it you know, and satisfying the judgments uh, 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 for violations of sanctions relief out, out of such a fund, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and that takes it away from US political and legal processes because it's an award issued by international arbitrators and if the US doesn't pay it, then it's, it's taken out of the escrow account. Thanks very much. Yeah. We have other questions too. We have to. So we have one question from me because we are close, uh, getting I'm close sorry, to the I'm end of the session. No, that's that was great. I appreciate it. So Mr. Kang, Menjin Kang uh, says, could you talk more about a bit about the role of interests of international banks in the negotiations? That's one question. And he also asked about the role of China, especially in regional security issues. Um, so what do you think of that? Well. Unfortunately, international banks uh, are not much of a constituency for this deal. And, you know, the, Sadek has explained why. You know, because, you know, once you get past the nuclear sanctions, there are all the financial action task force issues. And then, you know, there are the anti-terror and other issues about, uh, about uh, you know, banking. Iranian transactions and you know getting entangled in you know you know 
some very weird and and problematic politics. So if you're talking about, you know, and 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 the returns are not huge because as we know, Iran primarily trades oil. It would be a major transformation of its economy if it were to, you know, to start an export boom in other products or whatever. So so it's of limited interest to banks. It's high transaction cost and high risk, even if the nuclear sanctions are lifted. So conventional banks are unlikely to be, you know, like spending a lot lobbying for the JCPOA. But there are a lot of unconventional financial institutions uh, around the world. And, um, and they may have more of an interest in this if they, if, if they could be sold on the idea that Iranian business is actually going to be quite profitable to them. That's right. But this goes back to what you said at the outset, Sadek, about Iran's economy, the way it's managed by uh, the political elites. I don't think there's wild enthusiasm, even from some of these alternative financial institutions, in 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 you know in racing into this kind of space so ultimately the, you know integrating iran into the world economy has to wait for much larger yeah. you know challenges to be resolved including to be very frank and i'm just echoing what you're saying as someone who's much more of an expert and much more experienced huge challenges you know on on the ground Exactly. I mean, already Iran's trade volume is more than $80 billion, like exported uh, more than $40 billion last year. But that's not really the one problem is getting access to financial proceeds. And the other is that you cannot really grow substantially and sustainably with these kind of alternative mechanisms, like even the swap agreements, maybe like five, 10 percent of your whole you know, financial transactions or crypto or others. And that's what I'm worried about. So I want to uh, end on that note that my worry is for Iran to be become part of this structure of containment policy, which might work for the security of the region to a large extent, might work for the political elites that want to have some sort of a minimum amount of economic profits coming in for whatever. But that's not going to work for the benefits of the people at a large scale because we need 10 two digit growth rates for Iran to really make up for the past decades, lost decades that we had in terms of economic growth. And that's not going to uh, come through these kinds of uh, arrangements, alternative arrangements. We want a full fledged, really comprehensive arrangements, which I understand it's difficult. There's mistrust. There's all sorts of problems. But well, that's the same one. Way. I mean, you can't really talk about regional security with the with the partners of the JCPOA. I mean, you need to have Saudi Arabia at the table. You need to have Qatar. You need to have the yeah. UAE. I mean, that's you know, and and ideally, although they'll never go to the table, Israel. But but that's you know, right. I mean, you can't negotiate ballistic missiles. Uh, you know, limitations uh, yeah. uh, with Iran. If you don't constrain Saudi Arabia's rapid uh, development of its missile program. And could there ever be any normal relationship between Iran and the US without having Israel, so on, on, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, content with this? I mean, that's really what, what, given Israel's strong lobbies within the US across the political spectrum, that's really one of the very sensitive, important issues in Iran that, I mean, that's be, you know, gets out of the question, or out of the minds of the Iranian politicians, uh, that they could ever have any sort of uh, truce or any sort of normalization of relationship with Israel. They don't even recognize Israel. But is it even possible to have normal relationship with the U.S. having these kinds of tensions? Whoever created a chicken and egg game with with Israel, so really, really complex, really, really problematic. And and you, and you know, I think, and we're running over time, so this yeah, probably should yeah. be my last comment. Yeah. I think the administration, in subtle ways, is suggesting what might be the one route to that, which is starting with elements of normalization within the region, and so. My sense is the Biden administration has been encouraging of the possibility of 
um, uh, an Iran-Saudi Arabia dialogue of some sort, uh, a regional security dialogue, because on the one hand, Israel has now obtained some kind of quote unquote normalization with this, this group of Gulf states. If we can then have Iran, you know, um, realize that its interests are not, you know, in fighting proxy wars with the Saudis and so on. If, 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 if Iran can see itself fitting into some kind of relatively stable order, which recognizes that Iran is going to be an important power. I don't think they will ever agree to an arrangement that, you know, doesn't accept their, you know, their idea that they are the major power representing that form of Islam in, in the region. But that being said, if there could be some kind of normalization within that view, which would be kind of accepting that Saudi and Iran have spheres of influence, an idea that I think uh, is now being unfortunately rejected about Russia, you know, in the West, that just accepting these are the realities of power, then we may get some normalization or stabilization there. And then, you know, the Gulf countries can perhaps work with, you know, Israel towards, you know, a somewhat different stance about Iran and kind of help Iran also move off the ramp you know, of some of this extreme propaganda, which obviously, um, uh, you know, kind of um, feeds into the paranoia uh, of the, you know, that's being, uh, that, that the Israeli right tries to whip up. I say paranoia because it's clearly propaganda for consumption of a certain um, layer in, in, the, in the populace, uh, but, you know, doesn't represent the strategic ambitions in any way of Iran. Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, so, be, because it, we, are, we have come to the end of our time today, it was very fruitful um, discussion. Uh, we really, I really enjoyed talking to you. And thanks very much for accepting our invitation. Thanks a lot. Uh, really, thanks. really stimulating and and Thank illuminating. Uh, we could talk for many more hours. Thanks, yeah. Sadak. I hope our paths will cross again soon. And I really do hope for um, uh, you know diplomacy to work even in its short-term makeshift way uh, uh, for us in America and certainly for this administration. Yeah. I think it's far better to uh, any BATNA that we might be thinking about. Thanks so much. And thanks everybody for participating for today's talk uh, event at Nathanson Center. And uh, with that, I just uh, hope you stay safe and healthy and take care. Goodbye, Thank everybody. You. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.